Yevgeny Morozov, you're the author of a new book called The Net Delusion, The Dark Side of Internet Freedom. Yevgeny, why hasn't the internet opened up democracy? Well, uh, I, I would say that it has opened it up slightly, but it has also had many other effects which are actually detrimental to democracy, uh, particularly in the case of authoritarian states. And I must say that this book does not really focus on its impact on you know, the public sphere in the US or in Germany or in Japan. I specifically focus on places like Russia or Iran or China. So my study of democracy is limited to a very particular authoritarian context. Uh, what I think has happened is that the internet uh, has definitely empowered all sorts of forces and I would even say cultural and social processes that were already active in those countries. So has nationalism been empowered? Yes. I would say that you know the proliferation of numerous cultural resources online has helped many small nations within a country like Russia, for example, to establish and find their national identity, which is completely different from the titular Russian identity. You know, has uh, uh, also have all sorts of vigilantes in China who hate foreigners or who hate uh, you know, people with a progressive social agenda being empowered? Yes. They are finding details of people they don't like online. They launch mobs against them. They launch cyber attacks. They go after those people. So what I have been studying is not so much, you know, what the internet does, but more of what are the kind of forces and criteria that the internet actually influences. What is the political and cultural and social condition in a place like China? or Iran or Russia today and how it will actually be affected by the internet. And what I discovered is that, you know, governments who are already very active in surveillance, for example, will be empowered by the fact that so many people are using social networking and are using blogging to push for change. So if you want to examine the net effect of blogging on a country like Russia, you have to consider both the fact that activists are using it, but also the fact that the police are reading the same blogs and often are acting preemptively. So, uh, you know, I don't want to say that the internet has been absolute, you know, bad for those countries and that it has, you know, never allowed anyone to express their opinions. Of course it has. But to get an answer as to what it actual effect has been, you need to start with a much more refined and sophisticated social picture and social analysis of those countries. And the reason why so many people in the West, I would argue, misunderstood the internet's potential is that they started with a very simple framework where they only saw the opposition, the good guys, the guys who were pushing for Western values, and the bad guys, the government. They didn't see anything else. They didn't see any religious challenges. They didn't see any cultural challenges. They didn't see any other movements that, for example, may not be pro-Western, but they may also not support democracy. And that especially you know, is visible in places like the Middle East. So what I have been trying to do with this book is to try to add sophistication to our analysis of you know, how do we even start analyzing the impact that the internet has? You know, and like, what are the kind of areas you have to look at? Very briefly. What then has been the impact of the internet in Iran? Mm -hmm. Well, in Iran, it has certainly empowered the green movement up to an extent. It had certainly allowed them to spread messages and reach much wider audience. However, you also have to understand that you know any communication system that is open is likely to lead to overcommunication or miscommunication. People will suddenly start, uh, you know, putting in suggestions in front of you. You know, all kinds of movements around the periphery will want to influence the agenda setting. So what has happened in Iran is that the green movement got splittered. You know, there were too many parts and too many people were trying to influence the situation. I think the net result of that was that uh, it just lost leadership. You know, there was no formal centralized structure. And I think this is a mistake that many analysts of the internet make. They assume that you know, a decentralized movement would uh, do everything better just because Wikipedia does it better. You know, if you look at the history of world revolutions, if you look at 1917 in Russia, you know, there was one leader, it was Lenin. You know, he had a couple of people surrounding him, but it was a very centralized structure. And you know, the reason why they managed to do so much with so few resources was because they were a centralized force. The internet, of course, is excellent at decentralizing things, but it's not always helpful when you look at it from the perspective of a protest movement.